Open your Bibles to Judges chapter 7. And while you are doing that, I'll just let, oh, high school, middle school, you're dismissed. I'll let the men know of our body too. I was talking with our men's leader, Josh, and we got invited as a church to a men's conference coming up in early March. I'll get you more details next week. I do know the cost of the conference. It's $10 a man, which is a crazy cheap cost, especially because the two speakers are Daniel Fusco and Luke Frechette. So you don't want to miss that. It's going to be up north. It's about a three and a half hour drive from here. But we're going to get you more details and whether or not we'll carpool, do a hotel stay. But guys, be thinking about that. Be looking this week. We'll put information on our website for you as well. And then when Josh is back, he'll talk about it to you. All right, Judges chapter 7. And let me pray for us. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you would just fill me with your grace and your spirit, God, and your confidence. And that, Lord, as we read your word together, that, Jesus, we would be getting a word from you, God. Because, Lord, that is what we all desire. It's what we all want and need. God, it's just a touch from you, a word from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, a lot of you guys know we've been reading the life of Gideon and what was supposed to be a one Sunday message turned into a five-week escapade, okay? Filled with drama and sickness and all sorts of things. So uh, we're closing it out this week. And I can say that confidently because we made it through the whole message in 35 minutes in first service. Praise the Lord. Miracles do happen. That's good for you. Because I know a lot of you guys are going to want to get some lunch. But I want to read you this. Because we've been talking about Gideon. Remember all the crazy things Gideon's done. He's ripped down the family idol. He's blown the trumpet for war. He's stepped out in faith. He's rallied men to himself. Now I want you to imagine yourself in the life of Gideon one more time with me today. One more time, imagine yourself. Tonight is the night. All the preparations happened. Now it's the practice. You and your small band of warriors sneak up on the enemy camp. Now, I say small because there's only 300 of you, you and your 300 buddies. But everyone is all in, and there's no turning back. You ready your trumpet, check your torch, look at the positioning of your troop. You are 300 versus 135,000. Now, let me ask you, would you take those odds? Would you take those odds? <laughs> yeah, somebody at first service was like, uh uh-uh. uh, <laughs> couldn't pay me for that. Gideon did. Gideon did. And this is his Jesus story. And I love that he was living in a time when Jesus was doing the impossible. And don't you know that we're living in the same time today where Jesus wants to do the impossible? I'm going to give you three principles from our study. From our three-week study that turned into five weeks, I'm going to give you three principles. Write them down right now. If you take notes, write them down. If you don't take notes, start taking notes right now. Write them down. Okay, put them in your phone. You don't want to miss them. Three things I know to be true of God from this study. First off, principle number one, God is the God of the impossible. God is the God of the impossible. This is a God-sized story, and this is God doing God-sized things. Number one. God is the God of the impossible. We're going to talk about it again at the end, so just hold on to that. Number two, if you're taking notes, God wants to partner with our faith. Do you believe that about God? He wants to partner with our faith. He wants you and I to actively be a part of what he is doing. And Rich, if you could turn down my mic just a little bit. Is it loud out there? Sounds loud up here. Thank you, Rich. Um, God wants us to be a part of what he is doing. Now, when God is working and you and I don't respond in faith, guess who misses out? Yeah, me and you, not God. God's going to find someone else to do it. So when God is moving, you and I need to respond in faith. The third thing that I want you to write down, third principle from this study is this. God wants all the glory. God wants all the glory. Now, why does God want all the glory? Let me tell you this. Because when God does the impossible, he does so to reveal himself to man. Have you ever thought of that? When God does the impossible through you and me, it's so that he can reveal himself to the people around us and to us. To his people, he's deepening our faith, but to those who don't know the Lord yet, he's exposing himself to them. And if he's gonna expose himself, he wants people to know it's him. So if you want God to do impossible things in your life, you gotta give God all the glory. And we'll talk about that again later. So God, taking Gideon through all this preparation, And now tonight's the night we get to go through the practice 
uh, with Gideon. And we're, gonna, we're just going to go straight into the chapter. And we're just going to take it one verse at a time. And I'm going to set my timer so I don't preach you all to death. All right. This is what it says. Then Jerubbabel, remember that's his nickname, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. Now, Gideon takes his 32,000 boys. That's what he's got right now. You might say, well, how do you only have 300? Well, we're going to cover that. God's going to do a little bit of pruning. By a little, I mean 31,700 people out of his 32. It's quite a bit of pruning. <clears throat> but Gideon doesn't know that yet. And God's so good. He doesn't always give you and I the details, does he? He calls you and I to actions of faith. He doesn't give us the details because I think God would know we would panic. So Gideon and his boys, they go and camp in verse two. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hand. I love this. Can you imagine what Gideon's face must have looked like when he heard God say that? <laughs> I mean, 32,000 to 135,000 is a joke. I imagine it kind of went like this. The Lord comes to Gideon. He goes, Gideon, we got a problem. And Gideon goes, I know, Lord. There's 32,000 people here. And God goes, I know, that's the problem. Gideon's like, we needed more. And God's like, I was thinking we needed less. <laughs> less? Man, it's hard when God prunes, isn't it? But God wants the credit. And this is why, look what he says again, verse two. Gideon, we, you need less people because the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. God was going to give the Midianites into Gideon's hand. The size of his army didn't matter. He could have had 35 million. He could have had 300. He was going to win because God was going to give him the victory. God was going to give him the victory and God wanted them to know it was him. But in their own humanity, just like you and I with our ego issues, God knew that if they went to battle with 35,000, though that was a joke, or 32,000, sorry, though that was a joke, he knew that they would look at each other and go, we saved ourselves. Somehow we rallied and we did it and something worse would have happened to them. Look what it says right here. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me. And that's the worst place you can find yourself is against God. And that would have been worse than the Baal worship that they had had. Because what God was saying is they would have gone to battle and they would have said, you know, we don't need Baal to save us. We don't need the Lord to save us. We can save ourselves. And that's the worst place you can find yourself. There will be no self-saved people in heaven. There will only be forgiven people. And only God can forgive and so God said, Gideon, you're going to need less people. In fact, you can write that down. That's point number one. Victory comes from the Lord. If you're taking notes, we have three points today. Write this one in. Victory comes from the Lord. Um, do you want to pull up that first slide for me, would you, man? Right here. This is what it says. 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Isn't that beautiful? Just leave it up there for a second, Jonah. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Who's the one who gives us the victory? God is the one. I mean, just think about the gospel for a second. Isn't that how salvation works? Who gives the victory? It's God. God's the one who always leads us in triumph. And then not only that, but through those victories, he wants to diffuse the fragrance of his knowledge to the other people around us. You can take that down, Jonah. What he's saying is not only is God going to lead us in triumph, but, but God leads us in triumph that others may see him. So that the people around us look at us and they go, man, what makes your life so different? It's the Lord. It's God leading us in triumph. And out of that, the Lord uses us like we're all of his essential oil diffusers. I, I wanted to use like a very Ashland analogy so I could connect a little bit better. You know, when I first came to this church, I walked in and you're like, what is this smell? And the staff used to burn their essential oil diffusers. In our, and as like a, a homeschool kid from like a rural Oregon, I was like, this is one step closer to sorcery. We can't have this. I literally walked in, I'm like, what are you doing? They're like mixing oils. And I, I've only read books. I'm like, that sounds like sorcery. So we stopped it. <clears throat> Apparently it's medicinal, I've been told. 
But Christ wants to use you and I as his diffusers for his aroma. But the oil is his spirit and the fragrance is his son, Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? So you can go back to burning your essential oil diffusers. Uh, that's the obvious. Okay, never mind. We're just going to drop it there. All right, let's keep going. So verse three, now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. Ouch. Sometimes being obedient hurts. I mean, can you imagine Gideon? He's like, you you think we have too many? I was going to tell you. Okay, Lord, we'll do it your way. And guys, this is what I want you to do, Gideon. I want you to make a proclamation that anyone who's scared, faint-hearted, can go home. Gideon's probably like, all right, that's probably like at least 5,000 of the people. Over two-thirds of the army leaves, packs up and goes home. One that tells you where the morale of the camp was. Don't you know? They were scared. Shows you where the nation's heart was. Gideon must have been shocked. But you know what God asked Gideon to do was actually biblical. For those of you who are Bible scholars, you know that going back to Deuteronomy, let me keep up with my notes real quick. Deuteronomy 20, verse one through eight, that God actually told the nation as a precept when they go to war before the battle, they were to make a decree to the army of God that if any of you are scared, and not just scared, the idea is faint hearted, then you need to go home. You're free to go. God will let you off the hook because God didn't want that fear to permeate his camp before battle. Because remember, God wants to partner with our faith. Now, you might look at this and go, man, I, God will never use me then because I struggle with fear. Does anyone here struggle with fear? Okay. Some of you are too scared to raise your hand. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, guys, but it's true, right? We're like, I can't raise my hand. I'll look weak. <laughs> All right. Well, God knows that we struggle with fear. That fear's not the problem. It's what you do with fear. Let's look at the greatest warrior in the Bible, probably King David, right? Well, I'll think of David as fearless and courageous. Well, he wrote something in the Psalms. He said, whenever I am afraid, we all go, what? He said, I will trust in you. That's the key. We all feel fear. But it's what you do with that fear. That's what matters. And for those who couldn't get over that fear and place faith in God, God says, hey, then you're free to go. Because I don't want fear and doubt to permeate my camp. I want faith. So there's 10,000 people that stuck around and said, okay, I I think I can do this. I'm not that scared. But the Lord said to Gideon, oh, and I love this. The people are still too many. (laughs) Oh man, I wonder if Gideon was like, Lord, this was not part of the plan. The plan was we were gonna go to battle. You were gonna let us win and you're sending everyone home. Okay, God wants to do, God wants to do something great. So God tells Gideon, all right, Gideon, I need you to bring the people down to the watering hole. This is a watering hole test. And I will test them there for you, verse four. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you and the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. And likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. Now, There's no way of really knowing what this test looked like. And people have speculated that maybe those who lapped like a dog, they would have brought the water up with their hands, so they would have been more vigilant. So God was picking out only the best for this battle. And there's really no way of knowing. All we know is that God used this crazy test to thin out Gideon's ranks. Now, did God know that only 300 people were gonna be picked? Absolutely, God did. Does he have a sense of humor? I wonder, you know, like... Poor Gideon. (laughs) God's like, well, not that. We're not that. 9,700 more people going home. I wonder if Gideon was starting to like kick people and be like, hey, don't drink water that way, you know? Drink it the other way. (laughs) Get more recruits. But God's going to assure Gideon of something. Look at this, verse seven. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Gideon could not lose. Why? Because he had the promise of God with him. If God is for you and I, Justin shared it in his Devo today, who can be against us? Isn't that powerful? Guys, if God is for you, that's all you need. Gideon didn't even need 300. He could have gone alone if that's what God wanted. When God fights for his people, that's where the strength lies. 
So if Christ is for me, who can be against me? So God promises Gideon, look, I'm going to deliver you with these 300 men. He has the promise of God. Middle of verse seven, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. I wonder what was going through the mind of the 30,000, 31,700 guys who went home. They were probably all like, I'm so glad I did not get picked for this suicide mission. That man Gideon is crazy. Don't you know that's what they thought? I dodged a bullet. I almost drank with my hands. But look what God's doing right here. In fact, you can write this down. This is point number two. And it's a question. Point number two, it's a question. Are you small enough that God can use you? This is, this is the sad thing, guys. When God looked at Gideon and said, 32,000, that's too many. I mean, that should have been a joke. But God said, 32,000, that's too many. You're actually going to look at yourselves and say, we did this. That's how humanity works. That's our ego issue. And when God thinned it down to 10,000, we would go, surely with 10,000, God would get all the glory. But God knew even with 10,000, they wouldn't give him the praise. Let me ask you this. What does that say about our ego as a human race? That's kind of disgusting, isn't it? But how often has God done something in your life and you've taken the credit for it? We've all done it. So the question for point number two is, are you small enough that God can use you? Don't you know God can do anything? God can do the impossible. In fact, I want you to write the question again, but write it this way. Are you safe with God's glory? Am I safe with God's glory? Could God get, use me and get all the praise? You know, I think smallness is the same as greatness. I've been thinking about greatness a lot lately over the past six months. And what does it look like biblically? I think smallness and greatness go hand in hand. It's not being any bigger than you really are, nor is it being any smaller. It's just being honest about who you are with God. Are you safe with God's glory? Could God use you and get all the credit for it? God, guys, God wants to move. He wants to do the impossible things. He wants to do the things that only he can do, but he wants the glory for it. I remember my pastor, he used to always ask the question, are you safe with God's glory? And he just remind us, you gotta be the little part. You're just the little part. God's the big part. God has a part for you to play, but guess how big it is? This big, it's a little part. But God can move mountains. I love that. What a good reminder because you know, it's so easy to forget that, isn't it? It's so easy to think that I bring my own strengths and my own gifts to the table and God, you know, obviously I was the obvious tool, so God used me. Isn't it easy for us to feel that way? So messed up. I mean, God's had to remind me even in my own life, like, Cody, you can go somewhere else. I'll, I can use other people to do the work. It's true. But, oh man, I wanna be used by the Lord. And if that's you and you wanna be used by the Lord, then you gotta learn that. I gotta be safe with God's glory. Slide number two, Jonah, would you pull that up for us? Two verses, write them down, memorize them if you can. Isaiah 42, eight, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. God's not going to share his glory. It's his glory, my glory, and I will not give it to another, nor my praise to carved images. Pull up the next slide, Jonah. And which of you having a servant, and I love this, this is from Jesus, Luke 17, seven. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down to eat? But will he not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper and gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, you, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. Guys, memorize that. We are unprofitable servants. You know, God has, had to, God has had to teach me to memorize that because it's so easy to want to steal God's glory. 
And in that moment, when that temptation rises, that's the verse that comes back to my heart. I'm an unprofitable servant. What's special about me? Nothing. God can use anyone. That's why he uses people like you and me, right? If he only used special people, most of us would be disqualified. But God can use anyone. But who's gonna give God the glory? So am I small enough that God can use me? Let's keep going with this story. Actually, I'm gonna read you this quote. And then we'll go on with the story. This is what David Guzik said, and I love this quote. It says, if we really believe the principle, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, then our smallness does not matter. Isn't that beautiful? But he's not done. He says, if we really believe the principle, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of our, the Lord our God, then smallness doesn't matter. Man, I love it. Be okay with being the small part. Let God be the big part. That's the adventurous life. That's where you're gonna see God do the impossible things. So let's move on with our story. Verse eight. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands and sent, the all, sent them all away or sent the rest away of Israel. Every man to his tent and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below in the valley. So Gideon dismisses the rest of the army. They take the provisions, though. They got the trumpets and some supplies. And they go and they camp, and Midian's in the valley below them. And it happened on the same night, verse 9, that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hands. This is what I want you to notice. The same day that Gideon chose faith and obedience was the day God delivered the army into his hand. Is there coincidence in there? I don't think so. Remember, this all happened in one day. This whole part about dismissing the soldiers and these two tests, that happened in one day. And it took tremendous courage and faith on Gideon's part to step out in faith and obedience. But when he did it, God spoke to him and said, tonight, tonight, arise, go up against the Midianites. I'm going to give you the victory, Gideon. And God was gonna call Gideon to take that same faith and obedience that he had placed in the Lord when he dismissed the army and now go out against the Midianites. Remember, I told you that God actually does call you and I to a small part. And for Gideon, he was gonna have to lead these men in battle. And most of you know the story. You say, well, he didn't have to fight here. He didn't. But chapter eight, if you go read it in your Devo time later, because we're not gonna cover it in this study. Chapter eight, Gideon finally makes it down. He's been pursuing the Midianites. They're down to the last 15,000. He's cornered their two kings. And he fights them 300 against 15,000 to the death and wins. God was gonna call Gideon to incredible amounts of courage. I'm gonna give you the victory, Gideon, but you're gonna to have to step out in faith and wage a war. And I'm gonna give you the victory. So he says, Gideon, tonight, tonight, go down. Verse 10, but if you are afraid to go down, <clears throat> go down to the camp with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men, we're in the camp. Now, I love this about the Lord because God is so gracious. He knows Gideon's scared. Remember, it's like God knows that we struggle with fear. He just wants us to walk in faith. And God knows he's calling Gideon to do something that is humanly impossible. 300 versus 135,000. So God, just out of his mercy, just like he does towards you and I, says, Gideon, I'm gonna confirm this to you. You're not asking for it, but let me show you that I'm with you. If you're still scared, I want you to take your buddy, Pura, your servant, and I want you to go down to the camp and just listen to what they're saying about you down there. And, I, and if you're taking notes, I would write this down and just reflect on it later, but it's interesting to me that God didn't send Gideon by himself. Just, just a side note, just write it down for you Bible students. And that's typical of the Lord. Often God sends people in pairs. I think there's reasons for that. And I think if you reflect on it this week, God's gonna speak to you something. So just write that down. Why, did God, why didn't God send Gideon alone? So Gideon sneaks down to the camp. He probably felt like a little cockroach breaking through the pipes because he gets down there and guess what he sees? Now the Midianites, whoa. 
It gets caught in my beard. Now, the Midianites, verse 12, and the Amalekites and all the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts. Whew, that must make Gideon feel small. And this is what it says. I love this. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seashore. Okay, this is a camel story in the Bible, and I love it. And they were obviously afraid of the camels because they talk about them all the time. So not only was there 135,000 burly Midianite, Amalekite, Middle Eastern warriors, but there was also hairy beasts without number. Oh, guys, catch the flow of the story. This is what's going on. Now, I do need to confess that last time I taught you guys, I actually taught you heresy. <clears throat> and I was corrected, and so I'm going to own it. But uh, there was a, a group of young people, because remember last time I told you that I've heard that camels scare horses in battle. Do you guys remember that? Yeah. I've heard that. Has anyone else ever heard that? Anyone? Yeah, a few people. Some of you guys are like, yeah, I heard it last week from you. Okay, well, <clears throat> this is why you should really check things and read your Bible. So they, you know, instead of studying the word, they started, you know, Googling <laughs> to find out if it's true. And then these college kids, they waited until everyone had been ministered to, everyone had been prayed for. I mean, literally, they waited like 30 minutes or more. And they came up to me in a group, and they're like, iPhone out. We Googled it. Camels aren't, horses aren't afraid of camels. But this is what they discovered. Horses don't like the way camels smell. The smell of camels causes confusion to horses. So next time somebody asks you if you're afraid of them, just say, the way you smell confuses me. <laughs> yeah. What a cop out. Everyone knows the horses are scared. Who says your smell confuses me? Come on. It's like the same thing. But there it is. The smell of camels causes confusion in the mind of horses. Something like that. So there it is. Just details. This is for context. So Gideon goes down and he sees them. Verse 13, when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I've had a dream. And to my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. And it came to a tent and it struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. First off, is it coincidence that Gideon walked in at this exact moment? No. We always say here at our church, there's no such thing as coincidence. There is providence. Right? God had gone before Gideon and given a prophetic dream. Secondly, what a strange dream. And can you imagine like dreaming that bread rolled down the hill and took out your tent? Okay, well, what does it mean? Let's see. Then his companion answered and said to him, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. I mean, it's, it's exclamation points. He's scared. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. That's quite the interpretation. Right there, this dream is going on, and God confirms to Gideon that he's sending him. Now, I, want, I do want you to point out some things. Sorry, I do want to point out some things to you from this dream. Um, first off is that it was a surprise. Do you remember what the man said? He said, to my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp. Now, these are all important details, I believe. The second thing is, is barley bread was the bread that poor people ate. It's what would have been considered as despised or humble. Wealthy raiders didn't eat barley bread. That's what the poor people of Israel would have eaten. So the despised thing, the humble thing, came upon them suddenly. The tent obviously represented their amassed armies. And the tent collapsing was a picture of God bringing ruin at the hands of Gideon. Now, this is what's so unique about this. This dream seems almost silly. Have you ever seen a loaf of bread take out a tent? I'd be like, get a bigger tent or a better tent, right? Or that's a, that's a big loaf of bread. <laughs> I don't know who baked that thing, but it's got to be hard, okay? No, I think it was meant to seem silly because what God wanted them to know was that it was impossible and it should have been impossible. But that's the principle we talked about. God is the God of impossible things. And he wanted Israel and he wanted Midian to know that it was him that was winning the victory, it's going to be a surprise. Nobody would have believed if you told them. It'd be like bread taken out of tent. But nonetheless, it was going to happen. Verse 15. So it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation that he worshipped, and he returned to the camp of Israel, 
and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Now, for you Bible note takers, two things you need to notice from this. Gideon's response is twofold, and it's appropriate on both. First off, when he heard God's affirmation, when he heard the prophetic word, when he heard the gracious confirmation of God, he did the right thing. He worshiped. It didn't say he went home, he snuck home. He stopped whatever hiding hole he was in. He paused right there to worship God and say, Lord, thank you. The God of the impossible and just give God the glory and the praise and and just to adore him and praise him for all that he was gonna do. Guys, I don't think you and I stop to worship enough when God is moving. Gideon stopped to worship. The second thing he did is he brought the news to others. Guys, God is with us. He's for us. He's going to give us the victory. And then he led them courageously. It was twofold. First, he paused to worship and receive it by faith and say, thank you so much, Lord. And then he acted upon it in faith and shared it with others and led them into battle. So he comes home and he gathers them. He says, God is for us, verse 16. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put the trumpet into every man's hand. Gideon, by the way, is super excited at this point. Super excited. Look at his plan. He divides and puts the trumpets into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. What a plan. I'm actually going to do something for you guys later because I didn't have time to... We don't have enough time to develop it on this Sunday morning. But it's interesting to me in the Bible, the way God leads his people in strategy or doing things. Have you noticed? Nowhere in here does it say God gave him this plan. But no doubt the spirit of God had inspired it. But then there are other times, like when Joshua took Jericho, God was very detailed about what they were gonna do. You're gonna march around. You're gonna do it this many times. On the last day, you're gonna do it this many times. Then you're gonna blow the trumpet and then the walls are gonna come down. So how does it work then? When God's asking you and I do something, what do I do? Do I wait for God to give me the details or do I step out in faith and let God lead me along the way? The answer is yes. Okay, now if you're taking notes, you can write this down. This is an observation of mine that I want to develop later, but it says this. God does things differently at different times. Does things differently at different times. The key is to remain submitted. It is up to God to communicate the direction It is up to me to act on it. If God gives a direction with the plan, then acting on it out of faith, exactly the way he showed, that's the right response. Think of the tabernacle. But there will also be times when God gives me direction without giving me the details, and submitted faith looks like taking steps forward the best I know how and trusting. That's the only way I see it. That God does things differently at different times. Sometimes he's going to give you the detailed plan. Sometimes he's going to ask you to take the step of faith and learn on the way. Now, whatever way God is speaking to you, the key is to be obedient in faith and step out in it. So like when God came to Moses and said, Moses, we're going to build a tabernacle and I'm going to give you the exact specifications. Well, the right thing to do would do it exactly the way God said to you. And then there's going to be other times like this one with Gideon where God says, I'm going to deliver the camp into your hand. And he's giving Gideon an idea. And it may sound crazy, but Gideon's just going to have to step out in faith and see how God's going to make it work as he goes. Okay? And we'll talk about that more on a different day. So Gideon takes his 100 men. He's divided them into three groups. Verse 20, then the three come. Oh, sorry, verse 19. So Gideon and the 100 men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp. At the beginning of the middle of the watch, which is 10 p.m., by the way, if you didn't know. And at the beginning of the middle of the watch, I lost my spot. There it is. And just as they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers they held. And they held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands were blowing. And they cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, I love this. Imagine with me. They sneak up on the camp, three parties of them. And they wait till 10 p.m. when the watch is turning over. Because back in the day, there was three watches during the night that everyone used. It was 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. It was 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And 10, uh, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. I believe is how the watch worked, if I remember correctly. So they waited for the guards to break up and be swapping so there'd be some confusion. But then their plan is they all smash their pitchers on the ground. 
And no doubt the pitchers had been to hide the torches so they wouldn't see the light. Pull their torches out with one hand. With their other hand, they blow their trumpets and they shout out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And by the way, what a cry of faith from God's little army. What they were proclaiming to the Midianites is, God has delivered you into our hands. Your worst fears are upon you. The loaf of bread is tumbling down the hill. <laughs> Here we come, rolling in the dough. Okay, sorry, that was, I'm just gonna drop, I'm gonna stop for water. <laughs> Cha-ching. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> And they cry out. And now imagine what's going on in, in Midian. So this is what happens. Let's look. And every man stood. Oh, no, sorry, I'm wrong. Yeah, no, I'm right. Verse 21. And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army <laughs> ran and cried out and fled. Now imagine these poor dudes. They're all asleep. The night's tense, though. No one's eaten barley loaves in the camp. It's like a bad omen, right? They're all scared. And all of a sudden, the night is just, the silence is shattered, literally shattered, like glass shattering in the night as they break their pitchers. And the trumpets go blowing off all around, not one trumpet, hundreds of trumpets. And you got to imagine the Midianites come running out of their tents in the middle of the night. And remember, it's not just the Midianites, it's the Amalekites and the people from the east. And they look up and they're surrounded by torches and people shouting. And God's gonna do something miraculous in that confusion. But before he does that, look at verse 21 one more time with me. For you Bible students, I want you to see two things. Look at it right here, verse 21. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. Who's that describing? Israel's army. That's what I believe. Look at the second line. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. Who's that describing? That's the Midianites. Now there's something I want you to see here. When God's people take a stand on his word and rise up in faith, they're able to put large armies to flight. This is why I find it so unique. Gideon's only got 300 people. And yet at the end of the day, who's standing their ground? Gideon and his little army with torches and trumpets versus a vast innumerable amount of hairy camels and warriors that ride them. And the enemy with his overwhelming numbers is fleeing from them. Guys, I really think there's something there for you now. I think there's a word that when you and I take a stand, it's not about numbers. It's not about our own strength. It's about the strength of the one that was with them. God was with Israel. That was the difference. And you know what encourages me so much is I believe God is with you and I and our little church. He wants to use us to reach our community. In fact, I was having some fun one night and I, I looked up how many people are in Talent, Phoenix, Medford area, and Ashland. You know how many it is? It's like 111 something thousand. We probably have like 250 people in our church. Doesn't that kind of give you the chills a little bit? I mean, God's done bigger things with similar odds. <laughs> Guys, if God is for you, who can be against you? So Gideon and his little army, all that fear, all that trepidation, all that taking out a, a, a step of obedience and faith, and look what happened. Midian runs for their life. Now something else is gonna happen. God's gonna do something divine. Verse 22, now when the 300 blew their trumpets, the Lord sent every man's sword against his companion and throughout the whole camp and the army fled to Beth Acacia towards Zerara as far as the border of Abel Mahola by Tabith. So when the trumpets were blown and the people ran out, remember it's not just one army here. It's, there's like three plus armies here. It's Midian, it's Amalekite, and it's the people of the East, however many of those were. In the confusion and the chaos, God turns all those people against themselves. Every man comes running out of his tent, draws the sword, and they start killing each other. Wow. I wonder what it would have been like to be one of the guys on the hill shouting and holding a torch. Like, oh my goodness. Look at them hack each other apart. And by the time we get to chapter eight, which I said we won't actually get there, so sorry, we're not gonna get there. By the time you get to chapter eight, though, there's only 15,000 left. God did what only he could do and he took these three armies and he pitted them against each other and they annihilated each other. And they were so terrified and so scared of Gideon and God and what God's people were doing. They killed each other and then they fled. They ran for their lives. 
And so this is what happened. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and all Manasseh, and pursued the Midianites. Now, that must have been incredible. Because remember, that's, those are the tribes where the people had gone home already. Because they were too scared. Or because they couldn't drink water like the cool kids. So they all went home. Well, now they're all being invited back. Those who had been too afraid, now here they are, pursuing the Midianites. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. Verse 24, then Gideon sent messengers throughout the mountains of Ephraim. Now Ephraim's getting involved, saying, come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth, Barah, and the Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth, Barah, and the Jordan. This is where our last point comes in for the morning. Last point, if you're taking notes, write it down. All are welcomed to the Lord's victory. All are welcomed to the Lord's victory. I thought this was so unique. God wanted them to know that it was only him who could deliver them from the consequences of their sin. Did you get that? Remember, this is a sin story. If you, go, if you were here four weeks ago when we started this, you remember that I said that Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and so God let the Midianites oppress them. God's dealing with their sin and we talked about it then. We said, God wants to deal with people's sin. He's the only one who can, whether as the judge or as the savior. He's the only one who can deal with man's sin. And God wants to deal with it. And God wanted them to know that it wasn't their idols that would deliver them from the consequences of their sin. It wasn't even gonna be their own hand. It was going to be his hand because only God can truly deliver someone from their sin. Only God can do that. And when God had won the victory that only he could win, what does he do? He invites everyone else into the victory to experience it. A battle that they hadn't won, he had won it on their behalf, but they were all welcome to partake of that victory. Guys, this screams the gospel. And it's a theme all throughout the Bible. Jesus is gonna come, God in the flesh, taking on human form to deal with a problem that we couldn't deal with, our sin. It was a God-sized task that only God could do. He's going to live the perfect life, the life that none of us could live. And all of us knew that by God's holy standard, we don't cut it. We're condemned. No one is good enough to stand before God on their own strength. And so Jesus would come. Jesus would die. Jesus would rise again. It would be his victory. He would overcome sin. He would live the sinless life. He would overcome death. He would come back from the grave. And then he would invite all of us to enter into the victory that he's won. That's the gospel. Isn't that beautiful? Christ came and did on my behalf like God did for Gideon and Israel. They couldn't save themselves. He saved them. Well, that's the gospel. It's a mini picture of the gospel. Jesus came and did what, what only God could do on our behalf, and that was to secure salvation for mankind because we're bound by two things. We're bound by sin. We're bound by death because that's the consequence of it. None of us could overcome those consequences. So Jesus won the victory that we can never win and that he offers it freely to anyone to enter into by faith that all those who call in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're gonna find salvation. They're gonna find forgiveness. They're gonna find victory over sin. They're gonna find victory over death. God is going to transform them and redeem them. Because that's the gospel. That's what God wants to do. Only he can deal with man's sin. And when he does, he's now inviting man into his victory. So the question becomes, Who's going to take him up on his offer? I think there are people here this morning on our live stream, and the Lord is calling you to that victory. Maybe you've been like, man, I, I'm stuck. I've got issues. I've made bad choices. I've done things that I regret. Maybe you find yourself today stuck with an addiction. And you're looking at yourself going, I don't have it in me to win this battle. You don't. But Christ does. And for some, I think that's, that's being honest with God for the first time and saying, Jesus, I need a savior. Maybe you're not even a churchy person. That's okay. You need a savior. And Jesus is calling you today. I'll save you. I'll bring you into my victory. I'll change your situation if you can surrender in faith.
You know, I think there's others here too. Maybe you're coming back to Jesus after a long time. Man, what's about, what's, what is that about us? We're just like the nation Israel. We walk with God and then we do something stupid and 10 years later, we're like, how did I get here? And maybe you've walked away from God and God's calling you back today. He's saying, hey, I want you to walk in my victory. Today's the morning. What are you waiting for? To say, Jesus, would you forgive me again? Bring me back, Lord. Bring me home. You'd be a thousand steps that way. You're just one step from coming home. Isn't that so beautiful? Guys, whatever your struggle, whatever your pain, whatever your problem, Jesus is the answer. That I do know. He's the answer. Because all of our pain, it comes back to the consequences of our sin, doesn't it? Consequences of decisions that we've made. Even things that are out of our hand, like when our body faces hard diseases, we're just reminded that it's because humanity's fallen. Well, who's the only one who can cure that? Only Jesus, only Christ. So we're gonna give an opportunity for people to respond to that this morning. And worship team, you can come up as we wrap this story up. So all of Israel that's uh, made aware joins into this fight. And they're hunting them down. They're pursuing the Midianites. They're taking the watering holes, keeping them from escaping. Verse 25, and the people of Ephraim captured two princes of the Midianites. Oreb, his name means raven. And Zeb, his name means wolf. Isn't that cool? It's very picturesque of sin, the work of Satan. So the two princes, wolf and raven, are captured by the people of God. And this is what happens. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb. And by the way, I think they named the rock Oreb after they killed him there. I don't think they went out and found a rock named Oreb to kill him on. I mean, maybe, because then look, it says, it's just then they killed Zeb at the wine press of Zeb. So either it was super convenient or they named it that after they killed him there. That would be my guess. And, <laughs> and they killed him at the wine press of Zeb. Then they pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. Now, like we talked about, Gideon still has some work to do. He's gonna keep pursuing Midian until he's totally crushed them. And God is going to give him that victory. But all that came about because one man had the faith and courage to rise up when God called him to stand his ground in front of his enemies and say, Lord, you're gonna bring the victory that only you can bring. And a whole nation was delivered because of Gideon's faith, because of the faith of those with him. And so today, as we respond, we have an opportunity to step out in faith like Gideon. I'm gonna be up here in the front for those that are saying yes to Jesus for the first time. You're here, you're listening, you're like, man, I don't know the Lord, I'm not a churchy person, but today Jesus is calling me. And today I need to say yes to him. I would love you to come forward. Do, it's gonna be bold, but all the people here are cheering for you. We celebrate this at ACF saying yes to Jesus. I would love to pray with you. But maybe you're also in the category where you've wandered You've gone astray and Jesus is bringing you home. And I'd ask you to come up and let me pray for you as well. We just wanna welcome you back and celebrate what God is doing in your heart. But you know what? For the rest of us, I think there's great application to be reflecting on those three principles as we worship. God is the God of the impossible. Do I believe that? Let me ask you, do you still believe that? That God can do anything? Even in your situation, do you believe God could work? To be remembering that God wants to partner with my faith. It's so easy to let doubt drown me. And maybe for you, the mature child of God, God's reminding you, I want your faith. It's okay to bring God your doubts, just bring it with your faith. And then lastly, I love that one, that God wants all the glory. When Gideon heard what God was doing, he worshiped. And I think there's opportunity for you and I today as the people of God to worship. Just thank the Lord. Lord, for all you've done, for all you're still going to do in me, in my family, in my church, Lord, I praise you. I don't take opportunity to do that enough. But if you're here today and you feel like you're working through something heavy, and you need someone else to pray for you, I would like you to come up to you. You know, you might be like, I'm saved, I'm, I'm walking with the Lord. It's just, it's hard and I need someone else to pray with me. I would love to pray with you. Don't leave today without letting someone pray for you. And when you get communion, hold on to it, please, because we're gonna take it together. Brett, why don't you go ahead and play and Richie can bring the lights down.